managing hypokalemia. Mm. Let's start at the bedside. What are the three primary ways hypokalemia presents itself? We can really group the symptoms into three buckets. The first one is, well, it's very general and easy to miss. Okay. Things like nonspecific fatigue, malaise, maybe some generalized weakness. The kind of stuff that could be anything. Exactly. But the next two categories, that's where the real danger is. Especially for the heart. Absolutely. Yeah. The second category is all about cardiac effects. This is what should get your attention immediately. You're looking for dysrhythmias, ECG changes, or um, that life-threatening rhythm torsades to point. Cardiac instability, that's the killer here. It is. And the third category involves muscle function, which can go downhill fast. Okay, what are we looking for there? So this is the neuromuscular effects. It might start as just simple weakness, but it can progress. To what? To flaccid paralysis. And in really extreme prolonged cases, you can even get rhabdomyolysis. Which brings its own set of risks for kidney failure. A whole cascade of them. And you always have to be thinking about the diaphragm. Is respiratory failure next? Ah, uh, a critical point. Okay, let's get into the math of correction. The rules for replacement. What's the baseline ratio we all need to know? The standard rule, the one to just burn into your brain, is that 10 mil equivalents of potassium. Okay. We'll generally raise the serum potassium level by about 0.1 mil equivalents per liter. 10 for 0 0.1. Simple enough. It is, but, and this is a huge but, that rule starts to break down when the level gets severely low. How does that ratio change when we're talking about, say, a potassium level below 3.0? Well, that's where we have to shift our thinking entirely. Once you drop below 3.0 mil equivalents per liter, the amount of potassium you need just skyrockets. So it's not a linear relationship anymore. Not at all. It takes way more than 10 mil equivalents to get that same 0.1 bump. You're not just fixing the number in the blood. You're trying to fill a massive intracellular deficit. Right. The serum level is just the tip of the iceberg. Exactly. You're correcting total body depletion. All right. Let's talk about how we deliver it. The forms and routes. We almost always default to potassium chloride, but when should we consider something else? You have to look at the patient's whole metabolic picture. If your patient is acidotic, mm -hmm. then you should be giving potassium bicarbonate or potassium citrate. It helps fix both problems at once. And what about other electrolyte levels, like phosphate? Good point. If the patient is also hypophosphatemic, then potassium phosphate is the obvious choice. And is there a time to actively avoid potassium chloride? Yes. If your patient is hyperchloremic, adding more chloride is just not a good idea. Okay, let's discuss speed and route. For mild cases, say, above 3.0, oral is preferred. How fast can we give that? Oral is definitely safer for mild cases, and you can actually give it pretty briskly. We're talking 40 to 60 mil equivalents per hour. That's pretty quick. But if we need to move faster, we go to intravenous. What's the standard maximum rate for a single peripheral IV line? The strict standard limit is 10 mil equivalents per hour. And why is that limit so firm? It's entirely about patient comfort and vein safety. Pushing potassium faster than that into a small peripheral vein is incredibly painful. It burns. And can cause phlebitis, I imagine? It can, yes. So the limit is really about patient tolerance. But what if we need to go faster than 10 per hour, but we don't have a central line yet? You can. There are ways you can simply run it through multiple IV sites. Two lines would get you 20 an hour. Okay, so double the lines, double the rate. Exactly. Or you can mix the potassium into a larger bag of IV fluids to dilute the concentration. Yeah. That helps reduce the irritation. When do we absolutely need to switch to a central line? And what kind of monitoring does that require? A central line is for the truly unstable patient, the one with profound, life-threatening hypokalemia. And the rate can be much higher. Much higher. Through a central line, you can push the rate up to 80 mil equivalents per hour. But, and this is non-negotiable, that patient requires continuous cardiac monitoring for the entire infusion. 80 versus 10, that really highlights the urgency. Now, what about the absolute worst case scenario? Cardiac arrest from hypokalemia. In that situation, the normal rules go out the window. The protocol is to push 40 mil equivalents of potassium chloride rapidly through a peripheral IV. It's a life-saving exception. Okay, so the infusion is done. How long do we need to wait before rechecking the potassium level? This is a really common mistake. You must wait a minimum of one hour after the infusion is finished. Why the one hour delay? What's happening in the body? It's all about intracellular shifts. Potassium has to be pumped from the blood into the cells. That process takes time. So if you check too early... If you check too early, you get a falsely high number. The potassium is still just sitting in the bloodstream. It hasn't distributed yet. 
that one hour wait ensures the level is accurate. Understanding the why makes the rule so much easier to remember. It's just basic physiology. All right, let's move on to what I think is the most critical pitfall here. Mm -hmm. The the magnesium gatekeeper. Mm, yes, this is it. If you're struggling to correct hypokalemia, what is the physiologic link to low magnesium? This is the absolute key. If magnesium is low, the kidneys actively waste potassium. They just dump it. They just dump it. The channels in the kidney tubules that are supposed to hold on to potassium become leaky and you just pee it all out. So you're filling a bathtub with the drain wide open. That is the perfect analogy. You cannot fix the potassium if you don't fix the magnesium first. It's the gatekeeper. So if we find hypomagnesemia, is giving oral magnesium tablets enough? Absolutely not. Not in this acute setting. It's too slow. Absorption is too unreliable. You have to give intravenous magnesium to shut down that wasting mechanism quickly. Okay, so let's get specific on the dosing. How much IV magnesium do we give? The protocol is stratified. It depends on how low the level is. If the serum magnesium is 1.0 or less. So profoundly low. Right. Then you must give 4 grams of intravenous magnesium before you even start the potassium. And what if it's low but not that low? Maybe in the 1.5 range. If it's 1.5 or higher but still a concern, the dose is smaller. You give 1 to 2 grams of intravenous magnesium before starting potassium. But the principle is the same. The principle is always the same. Fix magnesium first, stop the wasting, then you can fix the potassium. Okay, finally, let's talk disposition. Who goes home and who needs a bed? What are the absolute ICU admission criteria? There are two major red flags. The first is respiratory. Any severe neuromuscular complaint where you're worried about the diaphragm. Impending respiratory failure. Exactly. If they can't breathe, they need the intensive care unit. And the second red flag is, of course, the heart. Always the heart. Severe ECG findings. That means runs of non-sustained VTACH, lots of PVCs, torsades, or really prolonged intervals. Any major electrical instability means ICU. What about just the number itself? Is there a potassium level that's an automatic admission even without those scary symptoms? Generally, yes. A level below 2.8 milliequivalents per liter is almost always going to be an admission, probably to a telemetry floor at least. And what about if the cause isn't clear? Also an admission. If you have moderate to severe hypokalemia and you don't know why it's happening, you can't send that patient home. Right, you can't discharge a diagnostic mystery. So what about the safe discharge? Who can go home? For patients with mild symptoms and a potassium greater than 3.0, they can be safely discharged after you give them some oral repletion. And do they need a repeat level before they leave? No, crucially, they do not. <laughs> if they're over 3.0, you can replete and discharge. What if their level is in that gray area between 2.8 and 3.0? That's the middle ground. They can often be discharged, but only after repletion and a repeat level that confirms their potassium is coming up nicely. And what do you tell them before they walk out the door? What's the key counseling? It's all about preventing it from happening again. You have to counsel them on high potassium foods. Be specific. Bananas, orange juice, avocados. But more importantly, if they're on a diuretic like a thiazide or a loop, yeah. you have to seriously consider starting them on a low-dose potassium supplement and ensure they have close follow-up arranged. We've covered a lot from recognition to the ICU. Just to recap the most extreme intervention, what's that fastest possible infusion rate? The absolute fastest is 80 milliequivalents per hour. But remember, that's only for an unstable patient through a central line with continuous cardiac monitoring. That's the ceiling. And we cover the kinetics, the replacement rules, and that critical one hour wait time before rechecking a level. And if there's one final thought for you to take with you, it's this. Know the 10 for low 0.1 rule. But if your repletion isn't working, assume it's magnesium. It's the clinical gatekeeper. It is always the gatekeeper. <laughs> Correct the magnesium first or you're just spinning your wheels. Always look for that hidden deficit.